Hello, everyone who is listening to our webinar today. I'd like to welcome you to our Hordes Dairyman monthly webinar. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an associate editor for Hordes Dairyman magazine. I'd like to thank you for joining us for this webinar, which is titled Clean Cows Make Clean Milk. We're very lucky today to have Jim Davenport as our presenter. Jim is a New York dairy farmer, and his farm has won the National Mastitis Council's Dairy Quality Award more times than any other dairy in the U.S. He's been working very hard on putting this presentation together, and we're excited to hear his tips and insight on producing milk of high quality. So, Jim, we look forward to hearing what you have to say today. Our sponsor for the program is Ozalea, and we appreciate their support and their assistance in putting together this educational opportunity for everyone who is listening. My co-host for the day is Mike Hutchins, a professor emeritus from the University of Illinois. And our teammates for the production today are Jim Baltz, our webinar producer, and Patty Hurchin, our Hordes Dairyman online media manager. If you're listening to the presentation live, you can click on the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel and print off a copy of the slides for future reference. Also, if you have any questions that come up during the presentation for Jim, you can type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel, and we will answer them at the end. Um, we encourage you to do that, and we are look forward, look forward to answering questions from you all a little bit later on. At this time, Mike, would you please go ahead and introduce Mr. Davenport, and we will begin the webinar. Well, thank you very much, Abby, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Jim Davenport. Uh, Jim is a fourth-generation dairy farmer with his wife, Karen, who happens to be his IT specialist, which is really important, and they began milking in 1986, uh, 12 years after the family farm in Connecticut was sold. Uh, they have a 64-cow tie stall operation with purebred Holsteins and Ayrshires in Columbia County in New York. They are members of Agrimark uh, Marketing Co-op, uh, where they have won top quality producer honors multiple times. The, Jim is also a board member of the National Mastitis Council, which is very prestigious. And they have won, the, as Abby already referred to, the National Milk Producers, uh, I should say the National Mastitis Council's Platinum Dairy Award six times. So, Jim, we're very pleased to have you on board today, and we'll turn the program over to you and Karen. Okay, well, thanks, Mike and Abby, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. As you've heard, I'm Jim Davenport, and I'm happy to be with you today. First, I must apologize for the quality of some of the images, but my narrative will help you to see the slides as, as though they're professionally done. At least I hope so. Our farm consists of a 64-cow tie stall barn. On, on milk calves are in hutches and 4 by 8 individual calf pens. We use bedded packs for wean to pre-breeding heifers and loop free stalls with foam beds and kiln dried sawdust for breeding age, bred heifers, and dry cows. Here I am with some of my buddies in the exercise lot. This photo was taken for our Hudson Valley Fresh website. Hudson Valley Fresh is a group of nine farms whose parent co-op is Agrimark. We own our own plant located in Kingston, New York, and we sell fluid milk and some class two products, yogurt, sour cream, and ice cream mix to be precise. And we sell that in uh, 350 direct store delivery customers in the Hudson Valley and in Metro New York. We sell an awful lot, at least we did before COVID, awful lot of our products to coffee houses and we deal with, deal with uh, distributors down in the Metro New York area. Our goal is for high quality milk from our farms to find its way to the consumers as fast as possible and tasting as good as it did when it left the farms. This is our family with two of our favorite cows. My wife, Karen, without whom everything you see in this presentation wouldn't have been possible, from the help of the computer to the love and support throughout our daring journey. She, like me, is a graduate of the University of Connecticut. She has a master's in animal science and a certificate in education. She has recently retired after 31 years of teaching ag science and technology. Colgate View Aftershock Bingo, excellent 92-2E stands between us. Daughter Laura is standing next to me. Laura got her master's degree in strategic communications from the University of Southern California's Annenberg School. After working consulting with food and agricultural clients primarily, she now works at Nestle, the world's largest food and beverage company. At Nestle, she helps lead executive employee communications. Currently, she's also managed the communications approach in response to COVID-19 for the 30,000 or so employees in the U.S. 
Colgate View, Braxton Blue, Excellent 93 3E is between Laura and her older sister, Kristen, who received her DVM and PhD in patho pathology excuse me, at Colorado State University. She is doing her postdoc at the University of Utah, studying virus restriction and engineering animals to be more virus resistant. My GPA in school was closer to bingo and blues. My wife and daughters were at the other end of the scale. I attribute my daughter's success to their mother's genes and drinking high quality milk at every meal. We milk twice a day and I usually milk in the morning. And this is me for stripping. I think it may even be bingo in her younger days uh, in, and uh, milking the cows. This is Dave Shalosky, our one full-time employee. Dave and I do most of the milkings and our relief milkings are done by a longtime family friend, Maggie McBroom who works full-time for the County Health Department, and my brothers, Bill and Scott, who have cows in the herd. This is a little slide about our farm. Um, the arrow indicates where we are in New York State. We're about a mile from Connecticut and Massachusetts, very far eastern part of New York, two hours north of Metro New York. We began shipping milk to Agrimark in 1986. We've been farming at this farm in Ancrumdale, Least Farm, since 1993. We have a few air shears and they're descendants from my grandfather's herd that was started in the 30s. A bit about our farm as far as uh, we try to strive to maximize forage in our cattle ration and with a greater than 70% homegrown forage diet. Our herd consists of 70 purebred Holsteins with a breed age average of 109.4 and like I said, a few registered air shears. We have received the Holstein USA Progressive Breeders Registry Herd for 25 years. Our February 2021 rolling herd average is 24,459 of milk, 946 of fat, 730 of protein, as I mentioned, on a twice a day milking schedule. This is our 2020 calendar year Agrimark cooperative data. Our raw count was 1417, lab pasteurized 19, and somatic cell count was 33,583. This is on about 124,000, 1,725,000 pounds of milk. And we also produce a little over 30,000 pounds of high quality fertilizer. I apologize for the fuzziness of the slide, but if I got any closer, the cats would have looked at me and not at the milk that was going into the gutter. They were really fascinated seeing milk going in there and not into their little drinking dish. This photo shows the beginning and ends of making high quality milk. It's taken from one of our two 20 by 60 foot silos that we, stall, we store corn silage in. The standing crops of BMR corn and tall fescue can see in the distance. Our grass silage is stored in the bunk silos. To the right of the bunks is our solids manure pile from the heifer and dry cow barn. You will see in the lower left hand corner what I have referred to in the past as our liquid manure storage unit, but now must also include surplus milk storage in the reference. Over 95% of our phosphorus and potassium crop needs are supplied by our manure. Our corn crop is grown manure only. This is our current diet. Uh, the base TMR is balanced for 80 pounds of milk, 4% fat. On a dry matter basis, is 80% of the TMR is homegrown grass and BMR corn silage, as long as you're willing to call corn silage a forage. Uh, ration crude protein is 13%, 13.7%. Um, our metabolizable protein, according to the CNPS model, is 79%. Of that, the methionine is 2.3%, and the lysine is a in pretty incredible 7%. I kind of included that for the benefit of uh, Dr. Hutchins. Uh, our high producers get top dress grain. Our total diet on a dry matter basis is 75% forage. This resulted in a February DHI test A average of 86 pounds of 4-1 fat and 3-2 protein milk. And now on to the sort of the reason for this talk, clean cows produce clean milk. And uh, this is just some of the things I want to touch on. Um, the cow's environment the challenge-free zone. Knowledge is good, know each cow's utter health. The cow's teat, the most important milk contact surface on the farm. And teat dipping, ask not what your teat dip can do for you, ask what you can do for your teat dip. 
And then conclusions. Okay, this here you see the barn as it appears after morning stall maintenance when the cows return from the exercise lot. Our stalls are large with foam mats well bedded with kiln dried pine sawdust. The back of the stalls are dusted with hydrated lime. During wet times, the exercise lot is pretty messy. Feet will come in dirty. And as the bedding dries the cow's legs, much of the dirt dries and flakes off, and the natural flow of bedding from the front of the stall to the gutter carries it away. The key point here is a clean, dry environment is the bacteria's enemy. And I just put this together. I don't know what everybody else spends on bedding. We spend way too much money, but it does get us results. And it's pretty, pretty obvious, 52 cents a day for the two ingredients in the bedding. Uh, not cheap, but at least we're getting something for it in milk quality. And this photo shows the cows at their cleanest and ready for milking on classification day. Um, generally, some cows' tails, the cows that are clean, will be clean as clean as that. Um, sometimes their flanks will be that clean, but occasionally they get a little bit of dirt in their tails or a little bit of dirt on their legs or um, on their flanks. But the teat is always pretty clean, and that's the important part is that's what contacts the milking machine. This is a photo in the morning that I took partway, and you can tell by the quality I took it, uh, partway through milking. And this is a thing that I like to see is the whole herd, after the pressure in their udders being relieved, all laying down in clean, dry bedding, chewing their cuds. And if I choose not to have the radio on and be depressed by the news, I can actually hear them munching. This, as the sign says, is a hoe. In spite of well-sized stalls with properly adjusted trainers, we still spend a fair amount of time throughout the day scraping back wet and dirty bedding. During milking, we scrape back all wet and or soiled bedding and afterwards bring clean, dry bedding from the front of the stall to the back so that when each cow lies down after milking, her relaxed teat sphincter muscle can close up in a sanitary environment. I would like to share a couple of stories from other dairymen. Before starting our own dairy in 1986, I was a DHI supervisor, regularly testing 30 herds and sometimes check testing or spot testing other herds while I was in college. Altogether, I probably viewed over 70 herds. The one thing that the low somatic cell count herds had in common was the cleanliness of their cows. Recently, I spoke to a friend who has two herds of cows totaling 3,000 cows with outstanding milk production and quality. I posed the question, how do you make such high quality milk in a large freestyle dairy? His answer, stall maintenance. They milk three times a day and during every milking, the cow chasers pull out wet, dirty bedding and pull back dry bedding. They also scrape the alleys three times per day. A milk, <clears throat> excuse me, a milk quality representative for an AMS automatic milking system dealer said, after making sure the robots were functioning properly, the next most critical task was to be in the freestyle barn, tidying the beds, and being sure that the cows were laying in clean bedding. And AMS can be programmed if you have particularly dirty cows that are dirty all the time. I know from my experience that a cow can be spotless six days in a row, and on the seventh day, she has managed to lay in a pile of manure overnight. I have the time to dry wipe, dip, rewipe, and dip again until I see that all four teeth are spotless. However, a milker in a large parlor with a high throughput doesn't have the luxury of time to do that. Therefore, the cows must have a clean environment. Again, it is critical to have the cleanest cows possible presented to the milker, human or robot. Okay, now that we've done everything possible on the outside of the cow, to produce clean, healthy milk, we need to consider those things that we cannot see, so it is important each cow's for each know each cow's utter health. This uh, slide is something that we can get away with without copyright laws. I would have liked to put up the statue that I'm going to speak about, but this will have to do. In 1978, when, as a slightly inebriated college freshman, I saw the movie Animal House. The first of many laughs I had was of the inscription on the fictitious Faber College founder's Emil Faber statue, which read, knowledge is good. 
over the last 42 years, and especially the last five years, much older and much more sober, all I can say is truer words have never been spoken. As I said before, the cow's teat is the most important milk contact surface on the farm. The first thing I want to know about each individual cow is her somatic cell count. These cows counts are usually pool samples of all four quarters. Robots being the exception to pool samples as they are quarter milk. The CMT, the California Mastitis Test Paddle, is the tool we use to identify individual quarter and high count cows. There are concise and understandable instructions for use in the CMT kit. I'm just going to give you a brief description of how I use the CMT. First of all, the orientation of the paddle is up to you. <clears throat> I have the handle be the head of the cow, so I keep it in order and keep the teats where the quarters where they belong. The idea is to put several squirts of milk into the paddle, one quarter per cup. Then the paddle is tilted to assure the same amount of milk is in each cup. It is important to be consistent and comfortable using this tool. Now you take the bottle of CMT solution and squirt an equal amount of solution to the milk in each quarter's cup. In most cases, you can standardize the amount by adding more solution to the cups until a uniform color appears. At this point, gently swirl the samples in a circular motion, observe the results. And generally, the more severe the infection in the quarter, the more high somatic cell count there is, the thicker the sample. And you will be able to identify this and quantify it the way you're comfortable with, but you will know what you consider a trace or a one or a two or a three, and you can report it accordingly. <clears throat> in my experience, when there is a high pool somatic cell count, it is usually observed in one quarter. And you, experience and practice makes this process second nature. We use the CMT to screen all fresh cows before they enter the tank. Colostrum is naturally a thicker viscosity than regular milk, so it will appear different anyway. However, the colostrum can still have a quarter with a high count and it will stand out. We check the cow each milking and usually the high quarter will self-cure. If not, we will culture it and wait for the results to determine the treatment protocol. If it appears to be getting worse, we will treat with a broad spectrum antibiotic and adjust the treatment if the culture results point to a better therapy. It is critical to know what pathogen is causing the infection resulting in a high somatic cell count. In our herd, gram-negative environmentals, for example, E. coli and Klebsiella are extremely rare. We usually see gram negatives like streps and staphs. Over 60% of the time, the cultures are negative, which may be due to the somatic cells engulfing and destroying enough bacteria that there are not enough left to grow a colony. We have a pretty good cure rate when we treat cows. The cows being healthy with robust immunity certainly helps. Here are the tools that we use to produce high quality milk. As you can see, there are milking gloves, a strip cup, teat dip, paper towels in the towel belt, a CMT paddle, and CMT solution. Our actual milking equipment is far from state-of-the-art. Some would say it's less than ideal. Small bowl size, hoses that are too long, and pulsation that isn't perfect. However, we just had the system checked. We aim for 14.5 inches of vacuum. It's 14.4. At this level, the vacuum down at the outlet of the claw uh, or cluster is at 10.5 inches at peak flow. This would be on the highest producing cow at the peak volume of milk. I truly feel that milking clean cows allows them to handle these variations from the norm. This is our milking routine. I will say that before step one, when we have our gloves on and we're milking, the first thing we do when we go to grab the teat to pore stripper is if we detect either moisture or dirt on the teat, we will dry wipe her before going down the process. And then it pretty much follows what is written here on the slide. We force strip, pre-dip with a non-return dipper, wait 60 seconds, and in the tie stall barn and knowing the cows, that can vary depending on if it's a heifer with a fast letdown or a cow with not as fast of a letdown. We dry completely with a paper towel, 
attach the machine with a minimal or no air intake. Properly position the machine for even milk out. Remove the machine when the vacuum has completely released. And then we post tip the entire teat. I would like to delve a bit deeper here. Our goal is to attach the milking unit to perfectly clean teats. The teat should be as clean before the machine goes on it as it is after milking is completed. The dirty teats I witnessed as a DHI supervisor were always cleaner after milking than before. I am sure that the engineers of teat cup liners didn't design them with teat cleaning in mind. Although when combined with liner action, milk as a cleanser works pretty well, but I don't believe that's much help to milk quality. This is a picture of our oldest cow, Fifi. She is excellent 94E with 275,500 pounds of milk, 10,225 pounds of fat, and a little over 8,500 pounds of protein. She'll be 13 in July and is due to calve in late June. At 223 days in milk, her somatic cell count is 38,000. She is very powerful with a deep body and short legs. The ends of her teats are the furthest from the pipeline of any cows we have. This is a close-up view of Fifi's right front tit. It is by far the roughest in the barn. Keeping her clean and dry negates the teat end environment that the bacteria love to colonize. So, ask not what your teat dip can do for you, but what you can do for your teat dip. What I'm going to tell you now should not be a total mystery. Give your teat dip a clean, dry teat to sanitize. If all you ask of your teat dip to do what is meant to do, you will not be disappointed. We use a good quality 0.5% iodine dip for pre and post dipping. It is very effective for us. It also has a mind to be gentle on the skin. Anytime you expect your dip to be a cleanser, you are adding cost and, in my experience, sliminess. The reason we force strip first is because it's much easier to get a couple good squirts per teat when your milking glove has traction on the dry teat. If the teats are clean and dry, chances are your milking gloves, which have probably been splashed with dip during the milking process, have very little chance of spreading pathogens. Then you follow up with free dipping using a non-return dipper. The goal is to cover every bit of the teat that enters the milking liner. This is why I call the teat the most important milk contact surface on the farm. Milk quality issues beyond what's inside the teat start with what's on the teat. Remember, it's a long way to the consumer's mouth from the cow's teat in. When we dip, we splash the entire teat, including where it attaches to the quarter. Another reason to keep the teats clean is that even the best non-return dippers will siphon a bit of dip back from the dip cup into the reservoir under normal conditions. I will better explain the thought with the following slides. This is a series of slides of me proving that deep dip can end up back in the reservoir. This is the empty dipper, which obviously is brand new with nothing in it, and the reservoir is being squeezed. This is the same dipper that I pour dip into the tea cup, none into the reservoir, and I have still compressed the reservoir. Now the dipper is at rest, expanded to its normal volume, and you can see it has drawn some of the dip from the top down into the reservoir. I contaminated this strip dip cup with sawdust to show something in the next slide. What we do when we have dip that we feel maybe is contaminated or every time we refill the reservoir, we pull the splash ring from the dipper. And then we, this is a slow motion view, but we generally flick the dipper down and expel the dip that's in the top as well as any of the contaminants. And then we snap the uh, splash rip back on. Former NMC president, Dr. David Reed, DVM, put together the most elegant and informative one-pager I have ever seen on why we dip and how to treat teat dip. The original tent for teat dipping was post-milking teat sanitation. The idea is that when you have a milk film on a warm teat with a relaxed teat sphincter, completely covering the teat with a splash of uncontaminated dip rinses off the milk and replaces it with a bacteriostatic film of dip. 
The droplet of dip hangs on the end of the teat, which gives extra attention to the teat end. Remember Fifi's rough teat end? A nice big drop of dip is going to prevent that rough thing from being inhabited by unfriendly bacteria. We manually wash calf feeding equipment after every use, and we do this after washing all of our milking aids. We use a good quality chlorinated manual cleaner containing surfactants. We then rinse everything in a phosphoric acid bath. The first things in the sudsy wash water are the pre rinse milking machines, which we scrub the outside once a day, and then the strip cup, the dipper reservoir, the cup itself and the splash ring. At the end of the milking, we try to have very little dip left in the reservoir. If it's less than an ounce, 30 mils, we toss it. Sometimes if I'm refilling the dipper for the last time and some news on the radio rattles me, I may overdo my refill. In this case, I transfer the leftover dip at the end of milking to a clean, dry reservoir and make sure not to overfill the next milking. Our tea dipper parts, strip cup, and my coffee cup air dry on a stainless steel shelf. We pump our tea dip from a 15 gallon barrel into a clean gallon jug that once held a cleanser or a water soluble drench. We replace that monthly. During the milking, the dip jug is always capped when not refilling the dipper. Dr. Reed advises never return dip to the container from which it came and never leave open containers of dip in the parlor as it could be in the line of fire. I would add that your dip supply should be kept in a clean area at room temperature. Another consideration is that throwing any of your plastic milking tools in the CIP wash vat is a no-no. The high temperature and harsh cleaners will deteriorate the plastics, making them porous and more prone to contamination. In this picture here is just of the old style slosh dipper, which works really well, probably requires a little bit more management than a non-return dipper. But the reason it's here is because I have a story to tell. People know me, know that I like to tell a good story. This story is a worst case scenario in the world of teat dip abuse. When we started shipping milk in 1986, we had a neighbor with a pretty nice setup. He had a great Kerbert Holstein herd and a stanchion barn sized more for jerseys than big Holstein cows. He had a beautiful deep bedded sand freestall barn. The cows would come into the stanchion barn for a bite of grain and to be milked. As soon as they were milked, they were released and sent back to the freestall. He only one milked one shift and the cows didn't lay down in the milking barn. The dairyman used the old style slosh dippers with his herd. He had used a lot of them in fact, he had hangers and they were at each plug-in station between every two cows. They would be refilled as they got empty. As you might guess, the dip got stale, got contaminated, and before he knew it, his herd semantic cell count went over 5 million. I don't know the exact pathogen. I didn't ask our field staffer from the co-op, but I suspect it was probably and hopefully Streptococcus agalacti, a bug that he could successfully treat. I do know he dumped milk for almost two weeks before it was good to go back to the co-op. This was quite a wake up call for me as we had started shipping milk the month before and I learned an awful lot about taking care of my teat dip. This is my oldest cow from a few years ago and this is Paige. She was 16 years old and she is one of my slides regarding myths. A lot of times people will say old late lactation cows are just naturally going to have a high somatic cell count. And I've found this to not be true. This is a copy of the DHI somatic cell count report that contains page. You can see it's her ninth lactation, 486 days in milk. Her somatic cell count was 38,000 and she was down to only giving 33 pounds. We couldn't breed her back and that she was soon dried off and allowed to live all her days on the farm. She made over 300,000 pounds of milk and uh, definitely was the best old cow that uh, oldest lived cow we ever had. Um, another uh, part on this misconceptions and, and it's, it's something that makes sense. Uh, liner slips and impacts. Um, 
in college, I learned that liner slips were not good, and they're not good. Uh, and we have a pretty good herd of cows with pretty good udders, and we try like heck to put the machine on, attach it properly. But physiologically, some cows are just going to have a quarter that milks out faster than the others. And if you have one quarter that milks out fast and three that are still full of milk, that one quarter on the cluster cannot get far enough up, creep far enough up on the teat to not squawk. And I have never had a cow that was squawking that resulted in an infection that I could ever see with any means that I know to detect it. And I truly feel that if you're milking really clean cows, what's bopping around in that bowl on the cluster and then what's getting impacted on the end of the teats that aren't squawking is nothing but clean milk with no bacteria load. Therefore, it'd be hard to infect those other quarters if there's no bacteria to infect them. And then another thing uh, that is still up for discussion, but I, as observation wise, um, as you can see, 13,000 is a somatic cell count by some of those other cows that we can have in our herd quite frequently. And there seems to be a thought that you have to have a good solid 200,000 somatic cell count or something along those lines for the cow to be able to fight off infection. And I'm of the mind that if the cow is running 13,000 and cranking along just fine, uh, that she can mobilize somatic cells if she needs to. And a cow with a pool sample of 200,000, most of the time in my observation, it's usually one quarter. And if it's a front quarter, that quarter could be a million. And if you have that many somatic, many somatic cells in that cow, she's already fighting off something. So I personally feel that as long as the cow is clean, unstressed, and everything's clicking in her diet, in her life, that she can fight off an infection pretty handily, no matter how low her count is. And that is the end of my talk. That's one of our sunsets, and uh, our Catskill Mountains, which are 35 miles away, are in the distance, and uh, it's a very picturesque farm. It's a very wet farm. Um, I can see all the prime farmland from my farm because we're on a hill. I just don't have any, but we managed to get some pretty good feed to the cows. Thank you for your interest, and I hope this was not the worst webinar you ever saw. <laughs> Hi, Jim. Thank you so much for sharing that information and providing that advice to all of us. Um, I know our audience is filled with a variety of people who are living and working on and working with producers of all different farm sizes and milking systems. But um, we all know no matter where our cows are being milked, that's important. Um, the importance of producing quality milk. And one of the best ways that we can learn new tips and tricks is to hear what other farmers are doing successfully on their dairies. So we definitely thank you for putting together this presentation and sharing your advice with us today. Once again, I would also like to thank Ozalea for their support of this program. If you wanna learn more about them, feel free to check them out online. If you would like to view this webinar again or share it with somebody else, it will be available online in a couple of days. So you can find it at our website along with all of our other past archived webinars at www.boards.com. And I would like to welcome you to our upcoming webinars that will take place in April and May. Um, our monthly webinars are always scheduled for the second Monday of the month at noon central time. In April on the 12th, we will have a presentation by our very own Mike Cutchins, and he'll be talking about the rising corn and soybean meal prices and what you can do to um, use those higher priced items in your rations or some alternative feed stuffs that might be available to you. So we look forward to that presentation, which is sponsored by Kuhn. And then in May on the 10th, we will have a presentation by Dan Schaefer from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he'll be talking about capturing the full value of Holstein and crossbred calves. Um, we know that there is a growing trend to breeding our dairy cattle to beef, and then what you do with those young calves and steers is very important um, to get the most benefit for yourself financially. So we look forward to both of those presentations coming up in the next two months. 
Now, Jim and Mike, we did have some questions that came in prior to the presentation and then some during the presentation. So Mike, if you wanna read those, and then Jim, we look forward to your responses and getting a little more insight about you and your dairy. Well, very good, Abby. We do have a couple questions that came in and I know our listeners are aware that you can send questions ahead and we have two. So Jim, here's your first one come from the wonderful state of Illinois. Do you have any comments on organic mastitis treatments? And then we'll do the second part after you answer that first part. Well, I guess um, I personally, and I suppose I should have said this before, and I suppose I'm ahead of schedule. So I should say that as a conventional dairy farmer, um, there's been a lot of pressure to do away the blanket, blanket dry cow therapy. Um, and I said, you know, I suppose if anybody should try it, we should try it because our counts are very low at the end of lactation on most cows. So um, right now, as of January 1st, we are only teat sealing the cows. And in order to reduce the pressure on the udder, um, we always give them a shot of a uh, killed 10-way vaccine when we want to start steaming them down. And then we put them on a high quality hay water diet and milk them once a day until they're below 20 pounds. And then we uh, seal the teats, post dip them, give them a few, uh, sometime, a few hours before we send them out so their teat, the sphincter is completely constrict. So along those lines, I think organically treating cows, I think prevention is probably even more important. And honestly, if the cows have a balanced diet and you are, you know, spending time, if you do have a pasture situation or a situation where the teats can get dirty, I feel that the extra income from the organic milk would give you the latitude to spend a little more time prepping the cow, getting their teats immaculate before they put the machine on. Um, I really don't know of any treatment that works that you guys can use. I'm not totally in tune with what you can and can't use, but if prevention is critical on a dairy that has antibiotic, op antibiotic option, I would say on an organic dairy, it's even more important. And Jim, I think you, your comments pretty well took care of the second part uh, on the overlap as far as that goes. So very okay. good answer. Let's let's move on to our second question. It comes from a Belarus and it says, do you believe in feed additives for increasing milk quality? I personally, I guess if the critical thing is the high quality forage and whatever you're feeding your cows to maximize the production of microbial protein, have your rumen really clicking and a lot of microbial protein. And you saw from our slide, our crude protein in our diet is pretty low to get that kind of milk. And I feel that if you are, if the cow is, in all the conditions I've spoken about and is, is not challenged in any way that you're, that's probably all you really need to do is just make sure that if you have an access to a nutritionist like Dr. Hudgens, um, try to just get the right feed into the cows and try to keep them really clean. And honestly, I think that's most of the battle. Okay, very good. Uh, let me just add one one comment. Uh, there's a couple of companies now that have what I call immune stimulators, which improve the immunity of the animals. And Jim, it falls right into your talk. Uh, uh, these products uh, can have impact on somatic cell count, on milk quality. Uh, you know, beta carotin has been looked at, another additive that actually, I'm not sure you call an additive, it's more like a nutrient. And then, of course, uh, we all know about vitamin uh, vitamin E and uh, selenium. And of course, Jim, you've got your nutritionist got that in in your dry cow and milk cow programs as well. So away we go. Well, you've just got a boatload of questions here, so let's go ahead and and uh, start them off. And uh, here we go. What's the average lactation of your herd? Do you have a rough figure for that? Uh, typically, do you make uh, three, three and a half, four lactations per cow on average? Do you have a feel for that number? I would say that it's it's kind of funny. Um, a lot of heifers um, will come in and, you know, maybe the hype was that the bull was supposed to be really good and some bulls have worked great for us, some haven't. So I'm thinking probably the average lactation is somewhere around, you know, four. 
And, and that's because I got some really old cows and a lot of two-year-olds that for every reason, we just didn't fit into what we wanted. Okay, uh, not to scare you, but we only have 17 more questions to go. So here we go. Uh, oh, what is the what is the minimum and maximum temperatures that your herd may face? And it appears, you, do you let them out every day, especially when it's cold in the winter? We, you know, we open the door, the door faces north. And in the winter, uh, okay, temperatures, first of all, uh, in Fahrenheit, when I could convert it, but my brain's not working that great, obviously. Um, we basically, in the summertime, we can have, in Fahrenheit degrees, we can be in the 90 to 95 degree range for a few days, very seldom more than three in a row, and they can always tolerate three days. We have constant airflow over the cows with fans over the cows. Um, the reason we have that is because we do have, have breezes up here even in the worst time of summer and we turn the fans to accentuate the natural airflow through the barn and it allows us to do a pretty good job cooling the cows in the winter it can get down to 15 or 20 below and then the wind chill can be worse and i will say if it's terrible weather outside we open the door to put the cows out they'll walk to the door they'll look at us and they'll refuse to go out so they don't have to go out if they don't want to. They always go out every day if they want to go out and if the weather is conducive to that. Okay, another question is, uh, uh, which test uh, can you perform or do you perform in a milking parlor to check the efficiency of the clean in place system? Uh, well, our, our barn, we have 400 feet of two and a half inch stainless. It's all well sloped. It's all an inch and 10 feet. Um, we have two two slopes on the pipeline. We have a couple splitters. We have dissimilar length uh, loops in the pipeline, and we managed to clean that with one air injector, a whole lot of water, and a whole lot of air. And um, I've had the uh, uh, Gia guy here with his um, I don't even know what the hell they call a tool that checks all that. But basically, what I did originally when we got this thing going, it was a digital uh, uh, slug test. And that was the one part of the um, longer loop of the pipeline where before we would have the slug fall when the other slug hit the splitter, I would stick a digit into the inlet on the pipeline. And when I felt the water splash the entire length of the finger that was in the pipeline, I felt we were doing a good job. And our my GIA... Um, uh, dealer, he just monkeyed with the air injector and got it so that it washed completely fine. And I guess, you know, as far as we just kind of, the thing you got to, we watch is um, the receiver, uh, because by the time the water gets there, it's kind of cold. And we look in there, and if that thing is always immaculately clean and the wash tub is sparkling, we and we know the air injector is working by the sounds and the way the slugs hit the receiver group and shake everything. That's kind of all we do. So it's it's not really high tech, but it seems to work for us. Sounds like a good plan. Uh, next question. Are you using automatic cluster removal or do you do it manually to remove the cluster under the cow? Oh, well, other than the occasional two-year-old that removes it by herself, we remove them manually. Um, uh, basically, uh, I never looked into that. I guess basically I figure with four machines, I can hustle pretty good and keep them going. We use a 60-40 pulsation ratio, which maybe is not the fastest, and square bore liners, but they're pretty gentle on the teats. And if somebody milks out and I'm there maybe 30 seconds or a minute after peak flow milk ceases, um, I don't feel it's harming the cows and I to keep it simple stupid thing works for me as I am not the smartest guy in the world so um, It's it just works to do it the way we're doing without takeoffs um, We can milk the cows <clears throat> in two and a half one person two and a half hours and do a really good job You know having milk and clean cows uh, Maybe just for clarification for our listeners when you say a 60 40. What are we referring to when you say a 60 yeah, 40? Ratio? The, yeah, 60 40. Uh, that's the milking to rest ratio in the pulsator um, 60% of the time it's milking and 40% of the time the liners collapsed on the teat and allowing the blood circulation uh, and blood to go back up into the circulatory system um, the 70-30 <clears throat> ratio is a, is a, is a spend 70% of the time milking and 30% of the time rest. 
uh, in that case, you once your teat is milked out, you really want to have that machine off uh, because it's harsher on the teat. At least this is my understanding. Okay. Uh, another question has to do what I'm going to combine two of them, and it has to do with percent cows mastitic. In other words, if you had a hundred cows. Would you have 1% mastitis? Is that typical in your herd? Do you have a feel for what that level of mastitis is and is it related? Obviously, it's not to age because you already showed us your old cows. Old cows are, are very clean cows. Yeah, um, it, uh, basically, um, oh, I guess is how do you determine mastitis? I mean, um, as far as clinical signs where you can actually feel an inflamed quarter, see evidence in the strip cup, um, it's very rare, and the inflamed quarters especially. Sometimes if a cow has an infection that uh, we see a whole lot of response in the strip cup, a whole lot of congealed somatic cells and you know all that business that comes out of infected teeth, um, those cows have mobilized tremendous amounts of somatic cells. And uh, the last one I had, um, I cultured her and she ended up being clean and cleaned up and her CMT was fine ever since. It's really hard to say. I mean, uh, I might treat, IQ treat lactating cows, um, maybe the average of one a month. Sometimes we'll go two or three months without any. Sometimes we'll have two or three in short order, but I don't reckon we treat much more than 12 cows a year while they're lactating. Okay, I think you touched on it, but let's summarize it. What is your dry off procedure uh, in your herd? Okay, yeah, that's something that I feel is pretty important. Um, and by getting away from, you know, dry cow therapy, blanket dry cow therapy has always been the rule. I've always used that feeling that I have less control over the teat once the cow is out of the tie stall and out in the free stall. Um, but the thing is, that does nothing for a cow that is in, you know, pre-fresh cow, that antibiotic is long gone. Uh, so the only time you'd want to, you know, make sense to use is prevent the early onset of the infection. So the way we dry them off is um, we give them a shot of uh, killed vaccine, you know, a 10-way lepto and all the respiratories. Um, and those, as a rule, my experience over the years has been, they will kind of knock the cow a little bit off their game and if you've got a cow that's you know going to be calving in two months and you got to get her dried down and she's still milking pretty good you give her a pop of that before you take her out of the milking ration and then we put them in a box stall and they get free choice high quality hay grass hay uh i used i tried it once to use old hay and i had an old cow go down with milk fever so I don't do that anymore, but you know, 56 NDF grass, a 16, 17% crude protein, all they want, all the water they want, and just taking them off that TMR pretty much knock in the, and the, um, you know, the, the uh, vaccination pretty much knock them off their game and they start to slack off on milk. And then we just milk them once a day till they're under 20 pounds a day, which would be about 10 kilos. And then uh we you know alcohol scrub the end of the teat after milk them out completely and wait the 15 or 20 seconds for the alcohol to dry and sanitize the teat opening and then we carefully put in teat sealant uh one thing that i've noticed with every teat sealant i've ever used is the teat sealant um syringe for lack of a better term every one of them <clears throat> has a bit of captive air in them they are not 100% product. And one thing that I've found that helps us is warm them to body temperature right before you use them. And I tap them down on the plunger, tap, 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 a whole bunch of times. And I pull the cap off and carefully expel that air, for lack of a better term, until I have nothing but product coming out of the cannula. And then I will insert that into the teat. I do not pinch the top of the teat. And if it's a really short teat, I'll only put half in, but I generally put the whole thing in. But I find without compressed gas behind it, I have less chance of shooting it up into the teat cistern when the compressed gas blows it up in there. And I've noticed that fresh cows, since we've been doing this, we don't get the mysterious blob of teat sealant 
two or three months after the cow freshens. We get much less of that. So I'm pretty sure we're keeping the teat sealant right in the end of the teat, in the teat barrel, right down to the opening is uh, where it's working for us. Are you, are you, are you doing selective dry cow treatment at all? Or are you I blank? will. Yes. As a matter of fact, one of the stars of the slides blue is the cow I was talking about the out of the clear blue sky had a whole bunch of garbage come out of her quarter and she self cured. And then a few months later, she had another episode that was strictly somatic cell and CMT related subclinical. I cultured her and it was a non-specific staff and I treated her and she cleaned up and the tester, I can't see anything on the CMT testers here today. Again, we will find out what her CMT is or excuse me, her direct, you know, somatic cell count. That particular cow at the end of her lactation will be treated. And because it's only one quarter, I'm not sure if we're going to do the whole cow or just the one quarter, but she will be treated. And with a broad spectrum, I'll probably ask someone at Milk Quality Promotion Services here in New York what they recommend for a staph antibiotic for a dry cow treatment. But that would be that would be what we'll do if a cow has a low somatic cell count from beginning of lactation to end. They will only get teat sealant. Very good. Now we're in the speed round, Jim. Uh, you aren't going to believe this, but now we're we're up to fifteen questions. We you you they're coming in I'm quicker game. than you can. I'm than game. You can I answer. spend so much time getting this thing ready. If you guys are game, I'm completely happy to answer them all. Okay, here we go. I, I, I do have any seasonality on the somatic cell count or milk quality issues on the farm, uh, summer versus winter versus the other seasons. Honestly. Now that we just don't see those environmental pathogens, no. So my lowest somatic cell count last July, the herd got down to 25,000 one, one uh, pickup. So no, I really don't, nope. Good answer. Uh, are you using any sire selections in terms of somatic cell count when in your, in your breeding program? Are you putting any emphasis on that, on uh, which bulls to use? Absolutely not, and as a matter of fact, I asked my DHI supervisor if it was possible to get a herd average SCS uh, evaluation. I don't even know what you call it, but it is in the sire book. And there are, you know, bulls that are supposed to be have daughters that are lower in somatic cell count. He didn't think it was possible. I would be really curious, but we kind of use the bulls as a purebred breeder to make corrective matings. And I do not choose for that trait at all. I just, whatever it is, it is. Okay, um, a question about tail. Since you're in a stanchion barn, or should I say tie stall barn, uh, what about the hygiene of the tail? Uh, are you nervous about that? Do you do any trimming of the tail to reduce some of the... The the, well, the, the one thing that we, I don't know, you probably saw in the pictures, because um, when we moved to this farm, the barn was a show barn. It was a six inch step up into the stalls. The concrete behind in the litter alley was extremely slippery. So we decided we would pour some concrete and, uh, uh, you know, brush, brush rough it up so that it would be better traction. I was going to go four inches. My brother said, oh, we should make them level. So we wheelbarrowed in 23 cubic yards of concrete and uh, brush finished it. And now they're grooved. But because we did that, cows have a crappy depth perception. And all of a sudden, before they didn't like jumping up in the stalls. Now they were afraid to cross the Grand Canyon that was between them and the stall. So we put in gutter grates, which solve the cows being afraid of the depth of the gutter and also keeps their tails out of the soup. So occasionally we'll have a somewhat dirty tail. Um, and if they swish you, hit you in the face, it's not too often you get dirty. It may sting a little bit. But we, because of that, we've been blessed in not having to go down the dock tail route. I will say, that in our dry cow barn, in the heifer barn, I bought some big fans to put up in there to maybe keep them a little less miserable in the hot, hot weather when we get it. But you know the cows that like to swish their tails in the soup because some of our dry cows are painted brown as far as that tail will reach. Others will lay on their tails or not. But by having gutter grace in the tie saw barn, we don't, that's not a problem. Uh, do you do any clipping or utter flaming of the cows or the hair on the udder of the cow? We tend to clip them because the environment in the tie stall barn in the dead of winter, it's with a fan going, it's good air, but it's about 40 degrees F. And if they're really, really shaggy, and as soon as we get a few warm spells, they get sweaty. 
So we pretty much body clip everybody. Fortunately, my brother who has cows in the herd comes up and that's his job. Thank God. Cause I'm not good at it. And, uh, you know, they will get clipped, and if the udders get a little shaggy, we'll clip them. But, yeah, the short hair is definitely helpful, um, and I'm, I suppose if they were more prone to laying in manure, it would be even more important. Here's a fun question for you. What are your top two or three recommended comments for high-quality milk? If you could just boil it down, what are your one or two or three must-do things? Clean cows and milk clean, dry teats i guess i could give a little analogy um i don't know if you could be anthropomorphic about bacteria but say you saw like this cow in this slide here or some of the pictures of a teat, clean teats in our say you're a staph bacteria and you're on a teat and you're there maybe up closer to the udder so you're saying god i'm thirsty i am so hungry at least up here it's a little bit warm then along comes a conscientious milker with a teat dipper. He splashes the teat. That bacteria gets begins to get washed away by the teat dip. On the way down, the bacteriostatic action, the oxidation of the iodine, ruptures his cell wall, and he blows up. And that's the fate you want for the bacteria. And by having clean cows and dipping them with good quality dip that's been treated right, to me, that's a whole bunch of it. And the mastitis professionals I talk to, when they talk about all the trials and tribulations they're going through with different dairies and things they're doing, and I say, do you think the answer is milk, clean, dry teats? They say yes. Fantastic. Uh, perhaps you can comment on this question. It doesn't directly apply to your farm. What do you think is the best way to educate and train workers on farms? Because on many farms, uh, you, the owners don't milk anymore. You, you hire that milking done. Any thoughts on your visiting on training uh, people to get quality milk? Well, I think one thing that management should do is understand that these, that the milkers are human and providing a really nice work environment and and you know make sure that they realize that quiet movement with the cows is critical and that the proper procedures um you know are are going to make their job easier and i don't i honestly think if you're really skillful and you're getting a quality premium the the help not only should they be thanked for that but perhaps they should share a little bit of that quality premium as an incentive and um i guess the most important thing to me would be if you're going to be in that parlor for a shift i don't know what the shift would be it's way longer than i ever have to milk cows in one sitting is you want to send them in cows that all they got to do is sanitize those teats wipe them off and milk them you know obviously four strip and all that but you should not expect them to have to spend a whole lot of time and with a high parlor throughput and have to clean dirty teats. So your stall management, um, to me, making their life less miserable in that regard would be something that I would highly recommend. Interesting question about the, he calls them or she calls them gun brushes. I think these are the automated scrubbers and automated tip dipping guns. Do, any thoughts about that automation in the parlor? Uh, you're in a stanchion barn, you probably don't have that. Yeah, I, um, you know, not, I guess my first thought is, um, you know, one of these single serve teat, uh, non-return teat dippers is not that heavy. And having all that apparatus at the end of my 60, almost 61 year old tired arms and shoulders, I don't know how long I'd hold up. Um, I think that anytime, and I know for sure at AMS is, uh, the, the brushes being changed at the appropriate intervals and um you know i i personally still i don't know if it's they recommend it but boy to take those have a, a little downtime to take a different washing solution maybe a chlorinated manual cleaner and scrub the, the jesus out of those things and then rinse them in an acid rinse that removes the soap residue i, I personally think that's pretty important. Um, I think the stimulation of the things and the cleaning probably works pretty good. But once again, if the cows are coming in really clean, they don't have a lot of work to do. They just got to sanitize that 
teat skin. Okay, what about teat end scoring? Are you doing any of that on your herd? And how often do you, you know, do it? If you do it? Keith Engel is going to kill me because that, that's his baby at the NMC. Um, but I honestly just look at the ends of the teats. And that one I showed you is far and away the worst one we've got. And um, I, I couldn't tell you what our score is. Um, I guess if, uh, you know, if you start, if you, I guess milking system performance wise, It'd be good to score the teats in a large dairy to make sure that everything was working right. But I mean, we're definitely, we don't have three quarter inch milk lines and huge claw bowls or cluster bowls and a two foot drop to a huge pipeline. We're doing terrible things to that milk to get it away from those cows. And other than that old girl and a couple other ones with long pointy teats, our teat ends look really good. Okay, are you using any uh, other chemicals you mentioned about at the base of the stall for uh, for the mattresses to kill bacteria on the mattresses and maybe in the sawdust itself? Yeah, the, the thing we found, um, I've heard people say that hydrated lime, which is pretty nasty stuff, um, can cause skin irritation and all that. Um, but honestly, I have never seen that on our cows. Um, years ago, we used chlorhexidine acetate bait teat dip, and that was harsher on the skin. I used it because it also is the only teat dip we could get that was also a viricide, and it did kill things, my gosh. But the teats did get kind of dry. They never got cracked, but they got flaky. And our somatic cell count was quite good. It was in the 60,000 range, but since we've been using the iodine, uh, and obviously, it's killing bacteria if they're there, but the teat condition is much better. And that hydrated lime we use, sometimes it's like you dusted their teeth with it when they get up. But honestly, it does not seem to affect the teat skin health. And I'm sure it's not a nice place for bacteria to want to set up shop. We did have a comment that came in from one, one, one person indicating there are organically certified products for treating mastitis for organic farms. Oh, so I think if you check around, you can, you'll find those listed as far as that goes. Here's your last question, believe it or not. We've condensed several of them here. Oh, maybe there's another one. Um, do you, this is just, just individual uh, applies a pulse spray to his dry cows using a, a spray lance. Uh, to keep uh, dry cow teats disinfected during dry period. Do you do anything in the dry pen at, at this point to uh, take care of that, or do you just not do that? No, I, you know, I think that's laudable. If somebody's doing that, that can only help. And I'm thinking that critical times is involution of the utter time when if you're only teat sealing them, especially, and then the prefresh pen when they're starting to drip a little milk. Um, I think that's a great idea, but no, we don't do that. And to be truthful with you, um, our teats and our dry cows are not as clean. They're not bad, but they're not as clean as a lactating herd. And that is something we could probably improve on a little bit. We don't have an awful lot of, we don't have environmental, you know, pathogen infection really at all lately in the last few years. But that would be something I'd like to do a little better job on is, is you know, trying to a little more bedding and, uh, than we do with the dry cow pen. And Jim, here's your last question, and that is, uh, any thoughts about using the individual disposable teat wipes to disinfect versus the teat dipping? And I think you're using the teat dip and, and cloth or, or, or paper towel. Thoughts about that? Yeah, we're using paper towels, <clears throat> and I think that um, if those things are, you know, it's up to, it's it, basically the, the, the dairyman has to figure on, you know, cost benefit analysis and all that. But I think that if they are wet enough with that, uh, you know, virus or bactericidal uh, dip or whatever solution that I think, you know, that would kind of be a one shot deal. Um, you know, wiping the teat, I'm assuming that it would not leave a big residue of teat dip on that we usually remove with, in our case, paper towels or in cloth towels. But, uh, you know, I think that might be something that has merit. Well, Jim, you've done a yeoman's job. We're going to turn the program back to Abby to, to wrap up uh, today's webinar. Abby? Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Jim, very much for answering those questions. Um, 
Once again, I want to recognize Ozalea for their support of our program. If you want to learn more about their mastitis and dry cow treatment options, you can find some information from them in the handouts. So if you didn't already, you can click on that handout section. And there are a couple of pages there that will tell you more about their company and their products. Also want to highlight our upcoming webinars. On April 12th, we will have a presentation titled Feeding Cows with $5 Corn and $450 Soybean Meal presented by Mike Hutchins. And then on May 10th, we will have a presentation called Capturing Full Value for Holstein and Crossbred Steers presented by Dan Schaefer from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Once again, Jim, wanna thank you for taking the time and Karen, you as well, to put together this presentation and share insight from your farm. Um, it was great to get a, a mini virtual tour of your operation and then hear what you do to produce quality milk day in and day out. So thank you very much for that. And then and finally, I would like to thank all of you in the audience for joining us today. It's always our goal to be able to produce, provide information for all of you, whether you are an owner of a dairy farm or working with dairy farmers, to um, things that you can do to help make your job every day better and benefit our dairy industry as a whole. So thank you for taking time to join us today. And we hope that you will join us for a future webinar. Until then, goodbye from all of us here at Hordes Dairyman and our team from the University of Illinois. And take care.